Just a brief note to you, dear listener. We appreciate your patience and support. A lot of editing went into this particular episode because we had some technical difficulties. Primarily, Bert sounding like this intermittently throughout the show. Well, it's interesting. The good news is he's cleaned up and we're ready to go. Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing. With the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And listeners like you who support us on Patreon or Substack. Sign up for exclusive benefits at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock or I Hear of Sherlock dot Substack dot com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 297, Mysterious Tales of Old St. Paul. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, it's I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your home's the meddler. Home's the busybody. Home's the Scotland Yard jack in office. (laughs) The game's afoot as we interview authors, editors, creators, and other prominent Sherlockians on various aspects of the great detective in popular culture. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts... Scott Monty and Burt Walder as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Burt Walder. And Burt, you seem, I don't know, are you more of a Minneapolis guy or a St. Paul guy? I think I'm a Minneapolis kind of a guy, but Mm. it depends because I'm speaking to you now with my head in a pumpkin. So it depends on what would go over best in either one of those cities. Well, I'm I'm sure the the fine folks from Minnesota will tell us. I'm more of a St. Pauli girl myself. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, we have a delightful interview ahead with Larry Millette, who has... Uh, long written Sherlock Holmes and Shadwell Rafferty stories. And uh, there's a connection, actually, because just a couple of episodes ago, we spoke to Jeffrey Hatcher and Steve Hendrickson from Minneapolis about their latest work together. And lo and behold, uh, Jeffrey Hatcher has a connection to Larry Millette through the Ice Palace murders. So, uh, should be a delightful discussion just about history and architecture and bringing Sherlock Holmes over to America. Uh, meanwhile, just a reminder, folks, that uh, you can support the show on Patreon or Substack, whatever way works for you, for as little as $1 a month. Uh, go to patreon.com slash I hear of Sherlock or I hear of Sherlock dot substack dot com. And there you will have access not only to ad free shows, but to bonus content as well. And um, you, you, you get the, the satisfaction of knowing that you're helping a fine quality show like this make it to the airwaves. Uh, so your help would be appreciated. And of course, if you are willing and able to leave us a rating on Spotify or on Apple podcasts, we would certainly appreciate that as well. It helps other people as they discover the show to see what people like you have to say about us. So thank you in advance. Oh, boy, that sounds like everyone's, well, I was going to say everyone's favorite segment. That's, of course, a canonical couplet that happens later in the show. Uh, But this is the time for Sherlockian news. 
Uh, what do we have in the way of Sherlockian news this time around, Bert? It's interesting in the world of Sherlock Holmes. There are things that are tangential to the world of Sherlock Holmes but are still important. For example, all the theater productions, the Loft Theater in Dayton, Ohio, is presenting the regional premiere of Kate Hamill's Mrs. Holmes, Ms. Holmes and Ms. Watson, Apartment 2B, through October 20. And it's the story where... Uh, detectives Sherlock Holmes and Joan Watson are female roommates joining forces in post-pandemic London. And it's somewhat comical with sort of an odd couple-like vibe, but they're really looking at friendship and empowerment and heroism and mystery and villainy. And the artistic director of the theater is very eloquent about how uh, deeply she loved and enjoyed the early version of Sherlock Holmes from Basil Rathbone to Benedict Cumberbatch. And so uh, it's done with a real appreciation for the characters. I like that. A little, little something for everyone there. And, of course, focused on friendship, which, of course, we know is the golden thread that makes it all the way through the canon. Well, uh, get yourselves ready for the holiday season. The Sherlock Holmes Society of London has its 2024 Society Christmas cards available. You get a pack of 10 cards and 10 envelopes for seven pounds. Uh, it's a piece of artwork that was uh, submitted as part of a contest. Mark Mazers uh, created this. It was, it's a digital rendering of uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Baker Street Irregulars and Dr. Watson, and a snowman with a deer stalker and pipe. Um, a little bit of controversy uh, on Facebook here, which I think is a bit of a tempest in a teapot. Uh, this is a, um, a, a digital rendering, but uh, there's a number of people out there accusing it of being AI art. Uh, there's no evidence to, uh, to, to uh, back that claim up. But it, it does have that AI style to it. Uh, it's kind of a modern take on a Norman Rockwell kind of portrait. Um, bottom line is, this is a, an annual process, an annual offering from the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. And if it's something that speaks to you and you want to use it to bring compliments of the season to fellow Sherlockians and Holmesians, and by all means, check it out at the link that we've got to the Sherlock Holmes Society in the show notes. And in the world of television and movies, Millie Bobby Brown, the star of Enola Holmes, has married Jake Bon Jovi. And you will want to know what her wedding dress was like. Well, she wore a structured corset lacy gown in a stunning white hue. The bodice featured a ruffle sleeve sweetheart neckline corset, which descended down into a mermaid-style fishtail lacy gown. And you will also want to know, who is Jake Bon Jovi? He is an American model and actor, and he's the son of the musician John Bon Jovi. So we hope they'll be very happy. And that Bush will soon be back to Baker Street. Goodness. Well, that, that's, that was quite the review there, Bert. Yeah. Um, no well, word I knew to, people would want to know about her wedding dress, hey, so you have to Was, tell was them there that. any word as to whether Henry Cavill was in attendance? Uh, no, no, I don't, don't think so. I don't know. May he may have been. You would think that if uh, Enola Holmes was getting married, that Sherlock would want to be there. Yeah. Well, um, and then finally, uh, just some news from our sponsor, MX Publishing. There's a, a couple of things uh, happening there. There is the uh, Sherlockian Advent Calendar. There's four versions of the Advent Calendar that's available for the holidays. And, of course, uh, once again, the Page a Day Calendar is available, 2025 Page a Day Calendar. I've been enjoying my 2024 edition. Uh, there's a canonical quote on every page, a canonical illustration, and something that happened on that particular day in history. And I must say, as far as quality goes, it is it far surpasses any page a day calendar I've ever had before. Because you know how with typical page a day calendars, you you rip the paper off, and then there's there's a little bit of torn paper left on that 
that that glue piece that sticks above and then by the end of it you've got all these little shards of paper sticking off it becomes more and more difficult to rip each successive page off well friends the sherlock holmes page a day calendar from mx publishing uh you get a clean tear (laughs) <laughs> with every page and uh it's, it's magazine quality paper a nice glossy paper um i really really have enjoyed this and i look forward to enjoying the 2025 version as well more news about uh, upcoming things from mx publishing will be on the i hear of sherlock everywhere uh website so make sure you stay tuned for that because uh, we have some news about some big releases ahead of christmas And that'll do it for the Sherlockian news as we close up the news bag here. Larry Millette is a journalist and author. He's the former architectural critic for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, a daily newspaper in St. Paul, Minnesota and the author of several books on the history of architecture in Minnesota. His nonfiction work includes Lost Twin Cities, Once There Were Castles, and Minnesota Modern, winner of a Minnesota Book Award. He's also written a series of Sherlock Holmes mysteries set in the United States and Minnesota in the 1890s. His books feature the character Shadwell Rafferty, who assists Holmes in his American investigations, all published by the University of Minnesota Press. The latest is Mysterious Tales of Old St. Paul, three cases featuring Shadwell Rafferty. Larry Millette, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, let's begin at the beginning, shall we? When did you first meet Sherlock Holmes? Well, I probably first met Sherlock Holmes when I was maybe 11 or 12. And I was a pretty sophisticated reader for my age. And um, I had uh, run across, um, you know, one of the stories somewhere. So I got myself the uh, the little three volume, I think it's a three volume or two volume, double day version of the all the home sales and started reading them and uh over the years uh you know went through the whole the whole lot of them and uh of course found them very uh delightful and uh they were great for a 12 13 14 year old reader you know uh especially when they're among your first detective stories so you don't know all the tricks for the trade <laughs> so you can still be surprised that's great did did other detective stories follow that uh, later on, I got into, um, you know, other detective stories. Uh, by the time I got uh, into high school, I was reading a few of the Agatha Christie's and things like that. And then uh, in college and afterward, I read pretty widely in the kind of classic English mystery novels. Also, a lot of the American hard-boiled, you know, Raymond Chandler and people like that who were uh, Dashiell Hammond who were also excellent writers in addition to being, you know, good mystery writers. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been kind of reading mystery fiction most of my life. Oh, I don't read as much anymore. I, uh, once I started actually writing and researching and doing so many different projects, I, I tend now to read more stuff for background information and knowledge. But I, I read... Uh, I still read, uh, I'll go back and reread some of my old Agatha Christie sometimes just for the fun of it. I always enjoy that. And I have a pretty large collection of um, of uh, novels by even going back to people like S.S. Van Dyne and some of those old characters. So I like, I like the classic stuff. Well, I'm not surprised, Larry. I mean, you have... <laughs> uh, Unusually, for the folks that we talk to on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, you have uh, sort of an educational background that is rooted in English literature, but oddly enough, somewhere along the line, you stumbled into both architecture and journalism. <laughs> I did, yeah, I know. Uh, Was that intentional, yeah. or did you, did you, uh, 
wind up no. one morning looking at your notebook and saying, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Uh, I, I do more architecture. Uh, no, actually, when I was a kid, uh, I, I at one point wanted to be an architect. And uh, I found out you know, subsequently that I really can't draw worth a damn. And I probably would not have been um, a, a good architect in terms of a design architect. I might have been good as one of the kind of behind the scenes guys, but, um, I was always interested in architecture and, um, and also in, in, in literature and reading. So, um, I went to grad school at the University of Chicago, um, did one year in English lit there and said, my God, I am not made for graduate school. <laughs> and, and, uh, so that's it. I can't do this anymore. So then I got a job, uh, working a small newspaper in, uh, Minnesota up in St. Cloud. And then uh, came down and started working for the Pioneer Press as a reporter, editor. Uh, that's the paper in St. Paul. Did that for about 30 years. But then about 20 years into that, I started writing um, architecture books, uh, history books, things like that. Uh, some books also on the history of journalism and photography. And then uh, while I'm sitting at the Pioneer Press, my good friend, John Camp, who goes by the name of John Sanford, uh, and who is, of course, a number one New York Times bestselling author. He started selling his mystery novels, and I thought, well, <laughs> maybe I should try. But uh, I wasn't a thriller writer, so I ended up uh, getting into you know something more to my taste, which was more classic types of detective fiction, and in my case, Sherlock Holmes. That's a lovely, lovely journey. Yeah. Very so, well, it's also... <laughs> There's also the fact that my first novel, when I, when it, this is absolutely true, uh, in the category of, of, of strange events, um, I lived in a house in St. Paul on what's called the West Side, which is right on, on bluffs overlooking Mississippi River. And I had an attic studio up there where I was doing my writing. And as I walked to the window, I looked down and this cross street there was Baker Street. Ah. <laughs> it was wow. kind of... <laughs> it was kidman absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah so well let's let's talk about that because i think this is uh you know the the interesting uh nexus here where you've just released your latest book of shadwell rafferty stories it's a collection of three uh novelettes or short stories but mm, no valid, um, yeah really yeah yeah and and you you got your start back in 1996 and eventually wrote nine uh, Sherlock Holmes Shadwell Rafferty novels. Talk, talk to us, walk us through the uh, the evolution of that, how it came to be. <laughs> well, the the first uh, Sherlock I wrote, and I didn't necessarily set out initially to write a Sherlock. Um, I was casting about some sort of historic mystery fiction to do and uh at the time i had been uh, assigned by the newspaper uh to do a story on the 100th anniversary of the hinkley forest fire in minnesota which was a big event in which more than 400 people were killed in a very large and dangerous forest fire and uh I went up and did a story about that, uh, and as I was kind of fiddling around, I was also thinking of what could I do for a, a mystery novel. And I thought, you know, Hinkley, it's kind of interesting—a forest fire. What if, well, yeah, what if somebody tried to start this fire, and, and what if there was some, you know, killer stalking the woods, as it were? And um, one thing led to another, and at some point, and I don't know exactly where, as I was thinking about all this, it occurred to me, well, wouldn't it be fun to bring Sherlock Holmes to Minnesota and see what he could do with, uh, you know, up in the north, <laughs> up in the north woods, <laughs> in the pineries. And um, so I started going back and uh, looking back through the stories. The Hinkley Forest Fire was uh, September 1st of 1894 and so i got out all my books and figured out that uh, sherlock was available uh he had just done the mystery of uh, the empty house story and had come back from the great hiatus and i thought well he's got he doesn't have another case until november so why not bring him to minnesota and that's how one thing led to another <laughs> and that's how i i started out and uh managed to sell that first book uh to viking penguin and then did uh uh, five more for them, and then the books after that were for the 
um, uh, the University of Minnesota Press, and then uh, Rafferty came in in the second book, uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Ice Palace Murders. I felt I wanted to have some local detective uh, who could be sort of a, a foil, but also a, a partner in some sense of Holmes along with Watson. So that's why I brought in uh, Shadwell Rafferty, and that was a pretty easy one for me. Uh, the idea of having a detective as a bartender struck me as uh, very natural. And, and my grandfather um, was a barkeep, a saloon <laughs> Saloon keeper in Minneapolis, um, who unfortunately drank himself to death at age forty. But that's another <laughs> another family story. Uh, mm. But I had some I had some connections with all of that whole kind of line of work. So I thought, well, uh, why not why not have a saloon keeper as a detective? Because who knows people better than a you know a bartender? Uh, he hears their stories all the time and. Uh, so that, that was kind of the impetus for that, and also to kind of get into local history. I'm very much of a local bore in terms of my writing. Pretty much everything I do is set in Minnesota. So I wanted to have a, a St. Paul character, and that's that I ended up with um, Shadwell Rafferty. That, that's amazing. So, uh, I mean, I'm sorry to hear about your, your grandfather's <laughs> life. Well, it was, a long time. it was a long time ago. A long, long yeah. time ago. Yeah. Did, did any of, I would imagine he heard lots of stories. Did any of those stories get handed down? Did they make their way into your work? Um, uh, to a, a little bit of a degree. I actually have some old uh, photographs of uh, the bar that he, he ran, uh, which was in um, uh, downtown Minneapolis, essentially. Uh, and so I, um, I was able to kind of look at some, use some of those pictures as, get a feel for uh, what bars look like in the late 19th century. He died, uh, my, my grandfather died in uh, 1908. I mean, it's a long, long time ago. So uh, so I have pictures of his bar around 1900, and I thought, well, this would be kind of fun to um, convey that, that atmosphere of, of what drinking places were like back then and also how incredibly common they were. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how many saloons that he's had back in the day uh compared to today and um so i so that was helpful just to have a little bit of that family background some of the old family pictures and whatnot but i don't really know any particular stories about um my grandfather in terms of what he did other than he obviously drank too much <laughs> it's on his death certificate uh yeah delirium tremens he died of which is not a pleasant way to go oh. Do you have any great cocktail recipes, Larry? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, actually, I'm not actually a, much of a drinker. Never, never have been. But Good. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a beer. You know, I have a beer now and then type of guy. I like my beer, but uh, but we have a little lounge around the corner from us that just opened. I live on um, beside a, a busy street in an uh, old historic row house here in St. Paul. And there's a nice little cocktail lounge right around the corner. So my wife and I go over there once a week and uh and actually talk to the bartenders a lot we know very well so so i'm kind of trying to get into that bartending uh mode more in my old age than i than ever was before well that's great see the you know the wonderful thing i mean as you know uh when you go to creative writing classes there's always someone in a book or a professor who will tell you to write what you know but in addition yeah, yeah. to writing what you know you know you're writing what you love that locavore area sure. And this yeah. era, I'm interested in um, the connection between you and architecture and lost the lost twin cities, mm -hmm. because I know you've written and studied about that. And now you've got these characters who are moving around in a forgotten age, and yeah. they must be moving around places that you are lamenting the absence of. Well, they're certainly moving around in places with which I'm very familiar, put it that way, historically. Um, yes, I've um, I've done an immense amount of research on uh, lost Twin Cities buildings and places. I have a huge database I maintain um, that I've also donated now to uh, some local libraries. So what I'm doing when I'm writing uh, themes in my book or trying to figure out where people should go, uh, what they should do, who they should do it with. I have a lot of information kind of at my fingertip that I can I can go to. So I, so my books are very accurate in terms of 
um, depicting actual places that were uh, in St. Paul, Minneapolis, or, or Minnesota. Uh, obviously, I add some things. Uh, there's some fictional type of things, obviously, that go into it. But but the the background, the kind of the the steady beat behind it, uh, is very accurately conveyed, or at least conveyed to the best of my ability. Mm. What do you? What do you? What's your personal feeling about all the architecture that's been? been lost i i ask because you know like you i i always have been fascinated and i've done some research but certainly not as extensive as yours and nothing to do with the twin cities but about right. new york new york city and and oh, the yeah. and you know when you get to be our age too you have the opportunity to see also what's changed in your own lifetime in these places oh yeah, yeah. i'm just yeah. curious no, have, how you feel yeah. about all that well, uh, you know, there, there's uh, obviously a sense of loss. Um, we've lost a lot of great places and, and great buildings over the years. Uh, but I'm also um, a realist. It, it, it happens in every American city. Uh, New York City, I'm pretty familiar with New York. My um, my second wife, <laughs> I'm my third wife now. I finally got it right. Uh, but my second wife uh, was uh, is from New York and uh, had an apartment there. So I spent a lot of time in New York. And she still has that apartment, which must be worth a lot of money now. Um, but uh, uh, I know a lot about New York history and Chicago history, two cities I know a lot about because I also spent time in Chicago. And, and if you look at Chicago, New York, Minneapolis, St. Paul, you name it, uh, they have all just been immensely destructive of their architectural history. And it's, it's easy to lament, but it's also very much a function of our economic system uh you know of capitalism um and people who go to european cities and say well how come we can't maintain stuff like that and it's because we're under a wholly different uh, approach to how we make cities uh how we um, maintain them uh and uh, i just have a read a book recently that uh the average uh, until the 19, 1960s, the average lifespan of a skyscraper in Chicago was 29 years. So that tells you something. <laughs> stuff comes and stuff goes. It's the American way. And, and the other big factor, of course, um, in American cities has been, uh, for, particularly for St. Paul and Minneapolis, but particularly for St. Paul, has been what the freeways uh, did to the downtown areas and to the surrounding communities. And they just tore up a lot, a lot of historic stuff, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm resigned to it. I don't like it. Uh, I know that we lost a lot of good stuff, um, but uh, it's, it's a story that has played out in pretty much every American city. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and well, I think... accept, yeah, yeah, like like New Orleans managed to save the uh, through special legislation managed to save the French Quarter, but had had that legislation not been passed by some far sighted people in the 30s through the undoubtedly totally honest Louisiana State Legislature, <laughs> they, uh, uh, the French Quarter would probably be gone today. But uh, there are a few success stories like that, but but not as many as you'd, you'd like to think there could be. Yeah. And and we've we've learned by mistake over the, yeah. uh, the years. Obviously, uh, the the poster child for that, of course, Grand uh, well Grand Penn Central Station was saved, but after Penn Station was destroyed. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I've got a couple of books on Penn Station, and it's you know it's just unbelievable <laughs> what they put put there instead. You know, it's, it's uh, you're like really what were you thinking? And but you can. You can see that all over the place, unfortunately. And uh, by the way, you know, Grand Central Station, one of the original architects of record, were from St. Paul. Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, yep. Reed and Sim, and they, uh, uh, another architect named uh, Wetmore from Warren and Wetmore basically stole the commission out from under them. And there was a big lawsuit, and Alan Sim, the St. Paul architect, ended up getting a $500,000 settlement. Uh, after he won the lawsuit against them, so it's a, it's a long and interesting story. If you're ever interested, yeah, there's a number of books on Grand mm. Central uh, that are that tell, tell the tale of architectural daring do and skullduggery. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I think the um, the interesting thing from my perspective is this nostalgia that we have, this wistfulness for these um, beautiful 
buildings, you know, these things of yeah. beauty when they were temples to transportation or temples to oh, commerce. Yeah. And uh, there's a, there's a certain grandiosity about them. And as Sherlockians, we have this similar nostalgia for a world that we never lived in. Uh, Edgar Smith, right. of course, from the Baker street journal called it, uh, a half remembered, half forgotten time of, uh, smug, <laughs> this snug Victorian illusion. And, um, you know, you, you chose 1894 in which to place your character um, smack dab in the middle of the golden years of Sherlockiana. You know, Vincent Sterra yeah. called always 1895. That's kind of where we we, we plant our pin. <laughs> and and so I think you have this wonderful opportunity to hearken back to the times of the, the early days of those great buildings of, of uh, architecture and those perfect days of uh, detection and, and uh, Sherlockian wistfulness. And, and streets uh, piled so high with horse manure that it must have stunk to high heaven. <laughs> yeah. I know. It, it's, uh, we, we always, we, we, you know, it, it would be, I always thought it would be really fascinating to go back, and I'm sure you feel the same way. Let's go back to 1890s London or 1890s New York. Uh, and, you know, have the whole experience and, and we'd come away, I think with, with wonderment at some of the things, but also being appalled by some of the things as well. So, um, you know, it's, uh, we always cast back with a, a fond eye sometimes and, uh, and that's fine, but, um, you know, people are people and cities were better in some ways and worse than others than they, mm. than they are now. Well, and, and considering that. Larry, um, in what ways did Shadwell Rafferty allow you to explore some of that in depth, and 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 how did you actually bring that realism to uh, your stories? Well, Rafferty um, was—I uh, I designed him to be a character who was very much into um, St. Paul, uh, who who knew everybody in St. Paul, who from James J. Hill down to the guy selling papers at the corner of the street. Um, and I wanted him to be that sort of, that sort of character who really, really knew the city and its people in a way that few other people did. And so that gave me the opportunity to really explore a lot of aspects of, of urban life uh, at the time uh, through Rafferty's eyes and through the, the plotting of the stories in a way that, uh, you know, you, you couldn't, if, if I just had Holmes, because he'd always be uh, if he, in the stories with Holmes and Rafferty, Holmes would always be, you know, sort of the, the guy from England who's trying to solve this case and doing all of his uh, brilliant stuff. But um, Rafferty was the guy who kind of knew the local way of the land and, and, and that kind of knowledge, as I think any police detective would tell you is, is very important in in solving cases is is knowing knowing uh all the kind of stuff that you it's hard for an outsider to understand i mean uh, i remember i I was years ago i i did a story uh, about two guys from st paul who went to boston to uh to teach and and during the desegregation of of the high school southie high school there in boston and you, you can walk into that and do a story and you really had no idea what was going on because Boston is just this tribal, you know, political atmosphere that, that you, people talk in code. And, you know, <laughs> you're just, and, and so I lived in South my, for nine years. So, all right, I so yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get what I mean. Uh, it, it's just, uh, and my wife's from uh, Haverhill mass, by the way. Um, and so, uh, but it, it, it's hard to, to understand a place uh, unless you're, you're there and, and know the people and the players and where the, you know, where the power structure is and all those sorts of things. Uh, and that's something that, um, Rafferty knew very well, uh, from his dealings with so many different people. And so I wanted, he made, enabled me to kind of get a really good sense of place for the stories and to, and actually to, you know, help with developing plot lines and things like that when you, when you um, have some idea of, of what was happening in the city at various times, who might have been responsible for various things, and um, and you know where the real power might lie, as opposed to what you think the power is. 
Have, have you had a chance to take um, Rafferty not out of his element, but out of his media uh, and put him on the stage or put him on the radio or do things like that? Or have you thought about that? No, I, it's funny. I just, um, uh, I, I, he, he has been on the stage. Uh, they made a, a, a Jeffrey Hatcher, who of course did, um, well, at least two Sherlock movies, right? At least one of screenplay for uh, the one with Ian McKellen. What was the name of that? Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey Hatcher, who lives here in the Twin Cities. And he did a uh, adaptation of The Ice Palace Murders, which was um, at one of our local theaters. Did a very nice job with it, by the way. And Rafferty stole that show, I thought, in part because they had a really good actor who was portraying him. Uh, and and that. so I, I have... I've. I've actually got a story now. It'll be in my next and probably final uh, book. Uh, but uh, it's uh, a detective story in which the detective is Oscar Wilde, uh, who, of course, was in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul in 1882. Uh, and um, I have a uh, Rafferty isn't in those stories because I could not, in good conscience, send him Minneapolis. <laughs> he's, he's too much. People, that's one of the local knowledge things. But back in the day, uh, all of St. Paul, and Minneapolis are uh, quite different in some ways and, and quite similar in others. Uh, in the 19th century, they were they were like separate little worlds, and they mm. had their own they had their own doctors, their own lawyers, their own architects own everything and there were people who lived in in st paul who never went to minneapolis and vice versa so uh, i think there's still are there are legendary residents of the east side of st paul who have uh there's an old story that they asked an old woman why she'd never been to minneapolis and said i never saw the need so there you have it <laughs> so um so yeah there's some of that as well but um uh you know just um like i say i i i write these stories to have some fun uh, to entertain, uh, to convey a little bit of history and lore, uh, and hopefully, you know, above all, just tell a good story. That's wonderful. Well, there are stories uh, that abound in Mysterious Tales of Old St. Paul, three cases featuring Shadwell Rafferty. It's the latest book by Larry Millett. Um, it, it isn't Sherlockian by nature, but it is by association. And that's why. Yeah. Um, and there are mentions of, <laughs> well, it's funny because I, there are mentions of, uh, Sherlock in the stories, uh, and also actually in, uh, the people in the stories, uh, some of the people in the stories are reading Sherlock or have read Sherlock in home stories, uh, because they're, they're set in the same 18 most of them in the 1890s time period so i i do have a few i sneak in a few little references to uh to sherlock and these uh, stories through the through some of the characters and i i like how uh rafferty is a bartender because this in some ways is, he's he's his own baker street irregulars Right, they were. <laughs> he does. Yeah, <laughs> they were trained to go everywhere over here. Well, people just come to to, to Shadwell's place, and he overhears yeah. everything right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he hears all, knows all, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, he, he uh, You know, I, I just think it was it was fun to have a character who really is uh, fully engaged in the whole kind of range of life in the city, not just you know. He, he he can go and have a meeting with James J. Hill, and they can swap stories. But like I say, he can go down and meet the street urchin and uh, and uh, talk to him, and then he just kind of knows everybody and, and knows what's going on beneath the surface there. And that's that's uh, that's what makes him, I think, an interesting character. Oh, right. Well, Larry Millette, thank you so much for joining us here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Um, nice talking to you, folks, and. Uh, we'll we'll keep on going here yeah please do <laughs> yeah well hopefully so uh so thank you and um uh, maybe we'll talk again after my next book isn't it fun talking to writers and they're all so different but here's larry with this incredible educational background and this interest in architecture and lost twin cities. And he he does all these books, 
uh, bringing homes to Minneapolis and his focus on locavore and what's going on in the Twin Cities and his interest in lost architecture. And the way he talks about doing something that's fun and entertaining and educating a little and telling a good story, um, you know, it's, it's, I find it very, very refreshing. It's amazing the variations of creativity that cross the world of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, and that's something that, that struck me, too, how he made uh, almost a seamless integration between Sherlock Holmes and uh, St. Paul, and then, of course, uh, blossomed into Shadwell Rafferty in his own right. And it strikes me that there are probably, just, just like architecturally, uh, as Larry was describing, there are probably numerous cities around the world, really, where a similar kind of construct could be made. If you know a little bit about your locality, know a little bit about humanity, and know a little bit about Sherlock Holmes. So the, the possibilities, as they say, are endless. It's a chance of listening with your correspondent, Madeline Quinones. Hello, everyone. I'm Madeline Quinones, and today I'm here to talk about a podcast that is, what would you call it, small, inconsequential, possibly a trifle? Okay, I would never seriously say that about trifles. In 2017, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere switched from an alternating format of interviews and discussions to interviews only, and Scott and Bert moved discussions of the canon to the brand new Trifles, the first weekly Sherlockian podcast. Trifles became a one-stop shop for all kinds of story elements and details in the canon. Do you want to hear about animals in the canon? Done. Character types? You bet. Locations? Absolutely. Story themes? Lots. Unpublished cases? History? Weapons? Professions? Sherlockian scholarship? Trifles? Does it all. And remember when I said that podcasts need their hosts to be some combination of interesting, entertaining, and charming? It's true of Scott and Burton, I hose, and it's true of them in Trifles. If you're not coming to that show for the banter as much as for the discussion itself, you are missing out on the enjoyment of listening to two friends having fun. Trifles is clocking in now at over 400 episodes, the biggest archive of a Sherlockian podcast. Although at only 15 to 30 minutes per episode, it still doesn't beat out iHoes in the amount of sheer listening hours yet. (laughs) One would think that by this point, our intrepid hosts would have covered everything there is to cover, and yet there's still more! So let's get into recommendations really quickly. My favorite episodes are the Master's Class and Mr. Sherlock Holmes' The Theorist episodes. Both types dive into Sherlockian scholarship, and it's a great way for some of us to learn quickly and easily about what's been written. Episode 285, Watson's Hidden Addiction, and episode 168, Watson Was a Woman, are excellent examples of these respective types. And of course, I can't help recommending 290, The Dynamics of an Asteroid, for reasons, not the least of which is diving into a paper by Isaac Asimov. And finally, just for the fun of it, episode 300. Langerton. That one is side-splittingly funny. So, don't take my word for it. Go check out the show if you haven't. Because after all, this little segment of mine is only a trifle. (laughs) Oh, Oh, Madeline. How interesting, yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, you yourself are interesting, entertaining, and charming. So we, um, we're honored. We're honored to have you uh, consider us such. 
Yeah, well, yes, and it's a lot of fun, and it's interesting to hear a report from somebody informed, as Madeline is, about what's going on in Sherlockian podcasts and to get her perspective. And you, Madeline, you have no idea of the future episodes we're going to be doing on trifles. It is completely <laughs> endless. For example, we've got in the planning stages, I think I can share this, Scott, Careful. a whole episode devoted to semicolons in the canon. And unusual punctuation and capitalization and corrected capitalization. There's just no end of fascinating topics we can t- <laughs> but But you'll wish there were. But, you know, Madeline raises a point that perhaps we died in the wool, we jaded old Sherlockians forget about, that there is a starting point for each and every one of us in the Sherlockian world. And part of our responsibility, I think, as uh, <laughs> as elder statesmen and women, is, is to bring along the next generation. Right to to help educate them and to bring them up to speed on what we know because it's a it's a collective history, and certainly John Lellenberg's uh, historic uh, you know archival history series as far as the BSI as an organization are one thing, and just the collected volumes of all of the Baker Street journals and all of the other uh, essential you know the the Shaw one hundred titles that we talked about these aren't necessarily widely known and it's something that we need to keep bringing up we need to keep talking about and as far as trifles is concerned we need to keep exploring these together okay you know what that is that means it's time for canonical couplet that's right it's everyone's favorite sherlock and quiz show where we bring you two lines of poetry and ask you to identify which sherlock holmes story we're talking about if you were around here last time you recall this clue no need of all that bother with the kaiser had lady hilda been a trifle wiser <laughs> bird ah <laughs> uh, I would say yes. you know what to yes. do, but I'm not convinced that you do. Um. <laughs> oh, you think so, huh? <laughs> well, I've given, look, it's very easy. It's obvious. This is the story, one of the great Sherlock Holmes tales. It's about the theft of the great Agra treasure and the four thieves who seal their pact by drinking beer from the same jug. It's the case Watson called the Stein of the Four. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I am sorry. Thank you. Thank That's you. Well, great um, music. It was a good try. It was a good try. And we are naturally turning to our pal Eric Deckers for backup help. He says, I've solved it. At least I have, if the couplet writer hasn't purposely sabotaged the clues again. It's the story where Sherlock Holmes wants to make a career move from consulting detective to musical performer. But Lady Hilda Trelawney Hope seeks to sabotage his career. It's the story once Hudson called Singing in the Stain. <laughs> Except I don't believe Holmes <laughs> ever did any musical theater, so it's more likely to be the adventure of the second stain. Unless the couplet writer is up to his usual tricks again, then it's probably the Hound of the Baskervilles or something equally ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Eric, Eric you seem to have your finger basket. right on the pulse of things here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere and the canonical couplet. Now, you were, you were right the first time around. It is uh, the second stain. Now, the good news is other people knew that, too. So we're going to bring in the big prize wheel and uh, give it a spin. Uh, round and around, landing on... Number 12. Number 12. And that looks like it is uh, Kim Gallegos. Kim, congratulations. Thank you for all of your enthusiasm and your active participation. Uh, we do have something, I believe, from the IHOS vaults from 
Uh, no, I'm sorry. We have one of H.B. Lyle's books for you. Uh, Spy Hunter, of course, is the one, the latest one up for grabs. So we will offer that to you. And now we have uh, another book available, uh, one of uh, Larry Millette's latest, Mysterious Tales of Old St. Paul. And that will be yours if you can answer this canonical couplet. Expensive ladies strain the longest purse, and silent watchdogs make things rather worse. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email address to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose yours at random, you'll win. Good luck. Barely got out alive on that one, Bert. Crazy. (laughs) Well, here we are, mid-October. Um Next time we uh, grace these halls, it's going to be nearly Halloween. What are you going to be this year? No, I I think you're going to be a podcaster who doesn't have interruptions on his microphone. (laughs) Goodness. An uninterrupted podcaster. That should be terrible. Uh, Yeah. Well, I, I think I'll go... I'll go as a podcast producer, (laughs) which means I'll be wandering the neighborhood aimlessly, unable to make any connections. (laughs) Ah, yeah. The the stuff you folks don't know about on this podcast, well, you're probably all the better for it. (laughs) You are. They're definitely all the better for it. Well, I will remain the constantly disjointed Scott Monty. And I'm the completely artifacting Burt Wolder. (laughs) (laughs) And together we say... Wonk, wonk. The (laughs) games. Uh, uh, The uh, 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 uh. (laughs) games. The The games of foot. I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.